virus out there. Case numbers are rocketing. The southeast of England and Wales are in lockdown. Scotland is banning travel to the rest of the UK. And from Boxing Day, Northern Ireland will also enter lockdown. For millions, Christmas Day celebrations are cancelled. It has come very late, very last minute. In short, there's a real sense that as a country, we are losing control of the virus. But here, we're going to keep calm and carry on, trying to find out as many facts as possible for you about the new strain of this disease, what it means for our behaviour now, and about whether this air of crisis over the weekend was absolutely necessary. I'll be talking to Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary. Why was this announcement so late? For Labour, I'll be talking to Lisa Nandy, the Shadow Foreign Secretary. But for, dare I say it, a higher perspective, I'll be talking as well to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. On the mutation of COVID-19, we have two world experts, Susan Hopkins of Public Health England, which has been assessing the new variant, and Maria van Kerkhoff, the go-to epidemiologist at the World Health Organization. You can't say we don't get the guests. You could say, yeah, but that's not very Christmassy, is it? To which I would reply, Annie Lennox, who has a carol to sing us out. Oh, Holly and the Ivy, when they are both grown, of all the trees that are To cast an eye over the news on this momentous weekend, I'm joined by the editor of the Sunday Times, Emma Tucker, and of course, who else? Our own Hugh Pym, the BBC's health editor. Before all of that, the news with Chris Mason. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. Millions of people in England and Wales are waking up to new lockdown restrictions. At midnight, London and large parts of the southeast of England were put into a new category of Tier 4, with an order to stay at home where possible. Similar restrictions came into force for all of Wales. The announcements were made as plans to relax restrictions over Christmas were reduced. Our political correspondent Nick Erdley reports. London last night, as some made a last-minute journey before lockdown started. But there won't be the usual Christmas getaway this year. Significant restrictions are now in place in large parts of England and in the whole of Wales. They're coming in Scotland. 17 million people in England are back in lockdown. In London, the east and southeast of England, people are being urged to stay at home. Non-essential shops are closed. Plans to allow Christmas bubbles have been cancelled. In the rest of England, and in Scotland and in Wales, Christmas is being cut back significantly. Instead of meeting for five days, Christmas bubbles will only be allowed for one, Christmas Day itself. It is with a very heavy heart, I must tell you, we cannot continue with Christmas as planned. In England, those living in Tier 4 areas should not mix with anyone outside their own household at Christmas, though support bubbles will remain in place for those at particular risk of loneliness or isolation. In Wales, lockdown was brought forward and came in at midnight. Nicola Sturgeon has said nobody should travel to Scotland from the rest of the UK and that she'll bring in a lockdown on the mainland from Boxing Day. It makes me want to cry, as I'm sure listening to it will make many of you want to cry, because I know how harsh this sounds. Um, I know how unfair it is, but this virus is unfair. The changes will come as a blow to many. The end of this tough year is going to be no easier. But politicians and scientists believe the risk is just too great. Nick Early, BBC News, Westminster. Also in the news this morning, a UK government source has said there'll be no post-Brexit trade deal with the European Union unless there's a substantial shift from Brussels in the coming days. It's understood there's likely to be a decision taken before Christmas about whether or not to continue the talks. They remain stuck on issues around fishing and subsidies. It's less than two weeks now until the transition period ends. And this year's Strictly Come Dancing has crowned its winner last night. If you're still hoping to catch up, leap behind the settee right now. I can now reveal the Strictly Come Dancing champions 2020 are... Bill and Ocean!
Phil Bailey and dance partner Oti Mabuse have become the latest pair to lift the Glitter Ball trophy. The comedian is the oldest celebrity to win, while his partner, the first professional dancer to win, two years in a row. That's all for me. The next news here on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Andrew. Many thanks for that, Chris. And with no offence to any of the other contestants, well done, Bill Bailey. What a nice, civilised, clever, decent man he is. The front pages, I'm not going to go through all of them because, frankly, it's all the same story. There's the Sunday Telegraph, Christmas cancelled for millions. The Sunday Times, Christmas is cancelled by surging mutant virus. And the Sunday Mirror, lost Christmas. But, of course, this is not just a story about England, it's about all of the UK and uh, slightly different rules everywhere else. So here's Scotland on Sunday. Nightmare before Christmas is their front page headline. Wales on Sunday, Christmas lockdown. And the Belfast Telegraph has an opinion piece by Suzanne Breen, which says, this cruel, the cruel cost of a very merry Christmas. Neither Arlene Foster nor Michelle O'Neill want to be seen as the Grinch, but Covid will run riot among festive gatherings in Northern Ireland. Uh, Emma Tucker and Hugh welcomed you both. Hugh, let's just start with you about some of the costs. Of it. It's very, very complicated for people watching because every part of the UK now has different Christmas rules. Well, that's right, Andrew. And in fact, The Sun has the question and tries to come up with some answers. What does it mean for me? Precisely what many households will be asking this morning. But to try and simplify greatly, if you're in a large part of the South East uh, and London, there'll be no household mixing at all. Uh, at any stage over Christmas, apart from somebody within your support bubble. Elsewhere in the UK, apart from Northern Ireland, which I'll come to in a minute, there is limited mixing on Christmas Day, and, and that is it, uh, with support bubbles as well. Northern Ireland, the rules will stay as they had been planned everywhere up until uh, yesterday, mm. with mixing between the 23rd and 27th of December, but then as a pretty strict lockdown being imposed there, immediately huh? after, after Christmas in Northern Ireland. Now, if this is a much more infectious variant of the, of the disease, we used to talk about one Hugh Pym being the social distance mm. between people. Are we going to have to think, is the government going to have to think again about social distancing rules, do you think? Where we met, wear masks, how far apart we remain, all those kinds of things. Well, the, the implication seems to be you've got to at least keep with current social distancing rules, maybe for some time. And, and you've, we've heard experts already in the last week or so before uh, we knew about the, the variant saying that we might be uh, with masks right through uh, next year until the autumn and some form of social distancing, although everyone help, uh, hopes very much for some relaxation after the spring with the vaccine having been rolled out very extensively. But I think we'll, we'll have to live with some form of social distancing for a little while yet. Do you think there'll be another national lockdown after Christmas going into the new year as things stand? Well, with Tier 4 in the southeast, it is essentially as it was in England with the lockdown in November. The question is, will it need to be extended beyond that uh, into the new year and beyond in other uh, parts of England and, and indeed in, in uh, the devolved administrations? And I think a lot hinges on whether the variant, which is very much in the southeast at the moment, uh, does spread further beyond that. That's the point of this tier four in that part of the country. And at a human level, there's some very moving stuff in the papers mm -hmm. about people who are desperate to get home to see their families for Christmas, living alone in flats by themselves, and really, really worried and desolate at the prospect of a, a locked-in, silent, solitary Christmas. Yes, the Mail on Sunday have a, a, a piece on this, partly on the last train out of Saigon, as they say. Last night, echoes of the Vietnam War, last helicopter out of Saigon, people... Uh, flocking into St Pancras and hiring cars and so on to get out of London, out of Tier 4, but also a couple of quite heart-rending quotes uh, from Michael and Rose, two people, different circumstances, but living on their own in London, hoping to get to parents for Christmas outside London, outside Tier 4, they now can't do so. And Rose saying it's been very difficult for her this year with her one or two mental health challenges, and now to be faced with this is very difficult indeed. Yeah, I must remember all of that. Emma Tucker, let's turn to you and look a bit at the politics of all of this, because Boris Johnson did look kind of ashen-faced and rather depressed yesterday, and uh, your Tim Shipman has got a piece on the front page of the Sunday Times about the effect on Boris Johnson as Conservative Party leader as a result of these measures. Yeah, I think, I mean, Tim has been writing about um, Boris Johnson for years and so has observed um, his trajectory as a, as a politician. 
And I think um, the piece is, is really reflecting on the fact that if you think back, it was a year ago, pretty much, that uh, Johnson won the, uh, won the election. Nothing could have really prepared him for what came about. I mean, fundamentally, his two big political challenges have been Brexit, but that was something he planned for. You know, he, that was how he got elected. That was his big thing. It was his subject. And you could argue that on that, he's sort of shown a resilience and a sort of determination but the coronavirus, I think there's a feeling that this, you know, any any leader would have found this a challenge, but some, some perhaps some leaders thrive better under pressure than others. Um, but it wasn't something that he planned for. And I think there's a feeling here, Tim writes in his um, column that he's, um, you know, he's he, on this one, he's a passenger rather than the architect. Um, and he, he finishes it talking about the, you know, the pressure on him as leader. And the Sunday Telegraph has got a bit more detail among, about those Conservative MPs who look at more restrictions and are getting increasingly furious with him. They are, they are. There's a very, um, I mean, there's a sort of ominous quote in the Telegraph um, main story uh, from Sir Charles Walker, who's the vice chairman of this 1922 committee of backbench MPs, said, uh, questioning whether or not it's time for Matt Hancock to resign. I mean, very few people have resigned uh, since the beginning of the year, mm. but you wondered to what extent these rebels are going to sort of keep the pressure up. Uh, well, Hugh, let's turn to the real culprit in all of this, which is this new strain of coronavirus. Another interesting piece in Emma's paper, the Sunday Times there, about actually what's changed um, to the virus itself. Can you talk us through this? Because it's quite complicated. Somebody was asking me, does it maybe have no spikes? The answer is it does have spikes. Which are possibly more effective. And there's a good piece by Danny Altman of Imperial College London on just this subject in the Sunday Times with a whole series of questions and attempted answers. He's saying it's really the business end of this variant and the way the spikes attack yeah. human cells because of uh, the mutations. But he does make clear we shouldn't jump to any conclusion that it's going to make people sicker. There's no evidence at all of that. The issue is, is how fast it uh, transmits, how fast it spreads. And that's the tier four issue. Uh, it, because it's spreading fast in With, that area, that's why uh, the, the restrictions have been imposed. Without anthropomorphizing, I can't even say the word, uh, anthropomorphizing the virus, you understand what I mean, Hugh, um, basically it wants to spread faster, but it doesn't particularly want to kill people faster. Yes, I mean, this is the whole theory of, of viruses and, and mutations. It's adapting the whole time. Um, but at the moment, I mean, to put very, put very brutally, um, there are enough people out there without, without antibodies who, who haven't had it, who, who mm. don't have immunity for the virus to, to continue spreading. And I think the other key point that, in this piece that, that is looked at is what will this mean for vaccines? And the conclusion so far, though nobody is completely certain, is that the current vaccines uh, will still be effective against this That's mutation. That's a crucial point, of but, course. Exactly. Crucial. But, but there is ongoing work continually at Port and Down and with the other experts on this. Emma, in other circumstances, we would have been talking about nothing except the Brexit trade talks this morning, and we've barely mentioned them so far. The Observer's got a piece, but there's very little about that in the newspapers either. I know. It, it, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, really, that it's not on the front pages of all the pa papers. I mean, the thing... Uh, they're limping on the talks. Um, no one quite knows uh, when they'll end. Um, the Observer story um, talks a bit about the sort of potential rebellion from Tory backbenchers. I don't think there's any suggestion or question that uh, a deal, if they, if Boris Johnson gets one, won't get through Parliament. But nevertheless, um, you know, the Observer's talking about 30 potential rebels. It wouldn't look good. Um, it would suggest that the Tory civil war you know, over Brexit isn't quite over and done with. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, the, the story as it stands now, as well as we've reported, is that it's really boiling okay. down to the two, two men at the heart of it, Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron. Exactly. And, and staying with voting, the entire nation's heart lifted, I think, a bit by Strictly Come Dancing. I don't want to overdo this, but Bill and Oti, there's a lot of air pumping and cheering in our house, though we liked all the dancers, I have to say. And he's a rather special guy, isn't he, Bill Bailey? Uh, so I gather, I think it's a bit unfair to ask him about um, Strictly, because I'm always at work on Saturday night. <laughs> However, I was aware of what was going on. And, uh, yeah, although I, I must take umbrage at everybody talking about Bill Bailey as the old candidate. He's yeah, 55. <laughs> he's, he's a lot younger than I am, anyway. I won't ask about you, Emma. But thank you very, very much indeed for joining us. Hugh, thank you as well. And so to the weather, blowy, very varied this week. I'm guessing 
that a white Christmas is too much to ask for? Let's find out. Over to Matt Taylor in the weather studio. Matt. Hi there, Andrew. I'm guessing uh, I think we'll probably will be uh, struggling to get one of those. But out there today, it's going to be much like yesterday. Mixture of sunshine and showers across the country. These are where the showers have been over the past few hours. Heavy ones clearing from the southeast. Speckles of blue, plenty of showers in the west. And you'll have noticed the odd flash of lightning thrown in for good measure. That will continue through the day. Showers most frequent close to southern counties of England and in the west. But even here, there'll be some bigger gaps between the showers later on. Some parts of eastern Scotland, eastern England will stay dry for the bulk of the day. A bit blowy, though particularly in western Scotland with gusts 40, 50 miles an hour and a little bit cooler than yesterday. Cool start to the night across the country. Temperatures may drop down to around 2 or 3 degrees, but turning milder from the south as we start to see yet more rain arrive. Falling onto saturated ground, river levels already high. Keep up to date with the latest flood warnings on the BBC Weather website. But as we go into Monday, a bit of a north-south split. We will see some brighter weather to begin with in the north. A cold feeling day here, but still some rain at times. Wet start for England and Wales, turning a little bit dry and brighter and it's here where we'll see temperatures around 13 to 15 celsius as for the rest of christmas week well expect some rain again across england and wales on tuesday and wednesday but by christmas eve and christmas day andrew it will be the white of frost on the ground rather than of snow it's gonna be chilly but dry back to you thanks so much a glimpse of hope there now just before we came on air this morning i spoke to dr maria van kerko who is covid technical lead for the World Health Organization, which has been in close contact with the UK about this new strain. I started by asking her, what do we know now? What we understand is that it does have increased transmissibility in terms of its ability to spread. Um, there are further studies that are underway to really understand the, how much faster this spreads um, and if it's related to the variant itself and, or a combination of factors with behavior. Those studies are underway. We understand that the virus does not cause more severe disease from the preliminary information that they've shared with us. Although, again, those studies are underway to look at hospitalized patients with those, this variant compared to other uh, wild type viruses. And there are studies that are underway to look at the body's ability to develop neutralizing antibodies. Um, and see, so those studies are, are happening as we speak, as we talk today. Um, and we're in contact with them um, regularly. They're sharing information with us as the results become available, and they're sharing the results with the public. Um, but it is a concern uh, that the virus is spreading and that it has so many mutations. Um, and so they're taking necessary steps to really better understand it. We need to follow the science. We need to follow the evidence to really understand uh, what this variant uh, does and the implications, if any. And when did you first hear about the new variant? Um, so we are working with U uh, UK scientists as part of our virus evolution working group, and they regularly speak with us every week. Um, they alerted us to the identification of this 501Y mutations. This is one of the mutations that has been, has been identified in Southeast England uh, over the last several weeks. And we've been working directly with them to better understand its implications, looking at genetic analyses. Um, and then as they are growing the virus to do more experimental studies, they've been informing us of the results of those studies as they become available. So, as you know, Andrew, so we've you, been following uh, mutations uh, across the world since the beginning of this pandemic. So you, you first heard about this several weeks ago. Is that right? <laughs> We first heard about it um, through the Virus Evolution, Evolution Working Group. I can check on the exact date of when okay. and of when we were alerted to it. But the UK had, had picked this up in, in September um, and seeing that this has been circulating uh, in Southeast England um, since September uh, and then looking at uh, the, the differences. In, but as you know, Andrew, mm -hmm. the, there are mutations that are identified all the time. Um, what is really important is that there's a process in place to understand what these variants do and how and how they behave. Let me ask about how widespread this is. We know that it's uh, circulating also in the Netherlands. We've seen big spikes in coronavirus recently in France, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy. Is there any evidence at all that this variant is also passing across the continent of Europe? We understand that this variant has been identified also in Denmark. Uh, in the Netherlands and in Australia. There was one case in Australia and it, and it didn't spread further there. Um, and so more sequencing that can be done uh, will be helpful to help us determine if this variant is circulating elsewhere. But it'll help also, sequencing will also help us understand any changes in the viruses that are um, being identified. The longer this virus spreads, the more opportunities it has to change. So we really need to do everything we can right now to prevent spread. Um, and minimizing that spread um, will reduce the chances of it changing. It appears to have originated, to have evolved, if you like, in England, in southern England. Is that your understanding? Is that where it started? 
It is, yes. So from the information that they've shared with us um, in, in either Southeast England or in London, yes. Now, given that it's more infectious, there's a figure of 70% being bandied around at the moment. Does that mean there's going to be big, big changes in social distancing and behaviour for people worried about this? So what we need to do is we need to look at uh, the interventions that work. Um, and it's a combination of interventions that work. And even with increased transmissibility, we know that this virus can be controlled in terms of limiting its ability to spread. Um, this has to do with the measures that are in place all over the world um, and in countries, including physical distancing, including avoiding crowds, making sure you wear a mask, you practice hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, um, and limiting your interactions with others. All of us need to look at what we do every day in terms of minimizing our exposure. Um, it's, it's a thousand little decisions every day about what we do. We need to know what our risk is when we go about our day, and we need to take those steps mm -hmm. to limit the risk. Um, the virus may be more transmissible with this particular variant and circulating in certain areas, but there are measures that can reduce the spread. At the moment, uh, the Netherlands has uh, banned flights from the UK. Should we expect other countries to be doing the same now? So it's, it, it is possible, but what we were recommending even before this um, virus variant was identified is to really look at your travel patterns as, the, as individuals, and especially as the holiday period is coming up and is upon us now, it's, you know, limiting um, travel un unless we need to, you know, trying to stay close to home, um, trying to remain socially connected with our loved ones, especially during the holiday periods, because we know how difficult this is, um, and, and traveling when, when, when needed. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot that we need to make sure that we hang on tight. Um, we are seeing reductions in transmission, you know, across Europe and across. I mean, this virus is dangerous no matter if we see a variant or not. It can spread. And there are steps that we can take to minimize that spread. Keep calm and carry on. Dr. Correct. Maria van Kerkhove, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Dr. Susan Hopkins is the Chief Medical Officer for COVID-19 at Public Health England. She's been tasked with carrying out research on the new variant of the virus, and she is with me now. Uh, welcome. Can I ask, first of all, we just heard from uh, Dr. Van Kerkhove that people were aware about this new variant back in September. But when did you first realise how infectious, how potentially dangerous it might be? So there's constantly evolution happening in the virus, and the virus mutates all the time. Uh, this particular variant uh, was identified from whole genome sequencing in the middle of October from a sample taken in September. It continued to spread um, uh, and in December, in early December, while we were trying to understand why Kent and Medway continued to increase despite the national restrictions, we found a cluster that was growing very fast and that had spread not just from the south of England into London and parts of Essex. Uh, we still did not understand what the difference in transmissibility was. And this week, the modelers and academics that we work with in, in Imperial and, and other partners demonstrated that it, it was indeed more transmissible than other variants circulating. And we alerted the government to this fact on Friday uh, and immediately government started to take action. Uh, we've had this figure of 70 percent uh, more uh, infectious bandied around. Is there a real scientific reason for that? Is that a hard figure, 70% more infectious? Because it sounds quite scary. Yeah, so that's based on modelling how the rate of increase of this variant compared to the other variants that are in circulation right now, looking particularly at data over the last few weeks to see how the virus has changed. Uh, we've also got evidence that the virus is showing higher viral loads. So there's more virus in the people who we are detecting with this virus strain. Uh, and that together um, gives both biological compatibility along with modeling data to show that it's more transmissible. We will be refining those estimates this week and, and continue to work on it as we have um, more isolates that we find with this, um, this particular variant and also understand it better. Does a higher viral strain mean that people are going to become iller? So that's not quite the case. It, what the, the illness is, becomes from the response, the immune response and how it acts in your lungs. That's where we know the illness really starts to be driven from and why people need oxygen. When we find the virus, we're finding the virus in the nose and throat. Uh, but the higher amount of virus means that people are likely to be in more infectious than they would otherwise be. And this means that we need to reiterate the social distancing measures, keep your distance, reduce your contacts and wear a mask. Now, um, 
We've also been told that uh, there's no evidence that it's any more resistant to the vaccines that we're waiting for. But it's so new. I wonder, both of those propositions, it's not going to make you iller, it's not more lethal, um, and it is just as um, compatible with the vaccines. How can we know that, given that it's so early on in the process? So we can look at the structure, and we've uh, looked at the structure very carefully, what the mutations do, and therefore the likely impact based on that knowledge of that structure. But we won't know for definite until we have further studies. We're studying individuals who are admitted to hospital at the moment to determine how many of those may have this variant, and is there differences in those that have the variant versus the other viruses um, of this uh, type that are circulating around at the moment. We'll be following all the individuals where we detect this variant in, uh, and that, as, as that happens, we will understand more about both severity and mortality. But we've got no early signals on that at all. all right. Um, in terms of the vaccine, uh, so again, this, the vaccine induces a strong multiple response, um, immune response, and therefore it is unlikely that this vaccine uh, response is going to be uh, completely gone, no matter the, the, with these changes in this virus. However, we do need to perform detailed laboratory studies studying individuals who've had prior infection and mm. who've had um, the vaccine and monitor the response sure. to the virus in cell cultures to understand that better. That will take a number of weeks. Uh, we need to grow sufficient amount of quantity of vaccine. We need to do a sufficient amount of experiments right. before so, that we can have a robust answer. So at this stage, we just don't know whether people who've had coronavirus already or perhaps have been vaccinated against coronavirus are susceptible to this new strain, but we'll find out soon, we hope. Um, can I ask about social distancing measures? Because you said we've got to stick by the, the current measures, but if it is 70% more infectious, a lot of people will say, don't we need stronger measures still? And you'll be one of the people I'm sure the government will turn to to find out the answer. You see, the main routes of transmission are still going to be droplet transmission, so that's something that happens within a, a, a metre to two metres. There is likely to be some aerosol transmission, especially if you're in rooms for prolonged periods and loud voices which is, uh, I think, why the government has made the right decision, although very disappointing for many, to uh, reduce the Christmas socialisation across the country and to uh, stop households mixing in London uh, and the southeast and parts of the east of England. I think those are really important measures. The, this virus will not transmit unless we're in contact with each other. Um, and really, close contact, indoor spaces, uh, reduced ventilation, all help drive the transmission of this virus, no matter what variant it is. And it becomes even more important that we all follow the rules to reduce the transmission of this variant. Were you completely horrified by the pictures of people cramming into London train stations last night when the restrictions were announced and thereby presumably spreading this across the rest of the country? I mean, I think it's, I understand people's wish to get home um, uh, they, uh, to their families and loved ones. Uh, that they may live with on a normal day-to-day -day basis and wanted to get out of London last night. Um, I hope that when they go to wherever they're moving to, that they uh, reduce their social contacts um, and don't contact anyone outside their household for the next 10 days, uh, as that will help minimise the risk of transmission to other parts of the country. We know it's in other parts of the country to small amounts, uh, but what we're trying to do is prevent more spread and rapid increases across the rest of the country. Dr Hopkins, thanks very much indeed for speaking to us this morning. Thank you. Thank now then, we're going to pause for a few minutes now and we're going to look back at how we got here. Imagine a year ago telling the Prime Minister that he would cancel Christmas for millions. Here's just some of what happened in the last 12 months. <laughs> It is early in the new year, but already new directions and an awful lot of questions. What are you infuriated about? Um, Lots of world leaders will be able to see this. What would your message to them be now, Sidney? This is the biggest problem humanity has faced ever. Do you regret saying that Britain was a small country that was going to learn from its mistake? Was that petty? I don't think so. Uh, it was, certainly wasn't intended to be. I want to stop myself from saying something too blunt. because Don't, of don't. Yeah, be but, as blunt as you like. Think... Can I ask you why people are kneeling, blindfolded and shaven and being led to trains in modern China? Why, what, what is going on there? I do not know where you get this video tape. 
you know, sometimes you have a transfer of a prisons. These are Uyghur people being pushed on the trains you, and me, taken let off. Let me tell, tell you this. With regard to that video cape, I'll get back to you. How do you persuade people of that level of fame to come on and do a very, very quick role? The moment Colin Firth said yes to playing Aaron Moore, you know, I could say to Benedict, Colin's playing a small part, and then oh, maybe I'll play a small part as well. <laughs> Let's go. Every paper has coronavirus stories trying to work out how dangerous it is. It's a reservoir yeah. of infections. Now it is passing from human to human, which makes the risk of an epidemic much more likely. Good morning. And the not-so-good news is that coronavirus is on the verge of becoming a pandemic. How seriously do we really take this coronavirus thing? The caseload globally for coronavirus has grown so much more rapidly than it did with SARS. The people on the front line are very, very vulnerable to getting this themselves. We are buying at speed uh, the sorts of kit that we need. Our public finances are in a very strong position, which means I can sit here and tell you I'll but take whatever action is required. You think the grown-ups are in charge? Well, I hope the grown-ups are in charge. Mm -hmm. I think there are lots of questions still to be asked, such as, can the NHS cope? I've just spoken to my on-call colleague at St George's, and interestingly, they are also feeling this eerie calm before the storm. Schools closed, streets empty, pubs and restaurants ordered shut, some never to reopen again. Millions of us effectively locked into our own homes and the death numbers climbing. The uh, date of the peak depends on all of our behaviour. One PIM is about the distance apart we should all be. Can you just stand up for a second so we can see Indeed. what one PIM looks Indeed. like? It's quite a long distance, if I may say so. I think this will be difficult for any government. Um, I do think there have been mistakes uh, along the way. The UK is likely to be certainly one of the worst, if not the worst, affected country in Europe. At the end of it, we will celebrate, we will grieve, we will have parties, we will have wakes, we will remember those we've lost. We're told Boris Johnson returns tomorrow to number 10. I'm joined now by the man who's been deputising for him and running the government while he recovers. A grim moment, 20,000 deaths. But it's a lot more than that, isn't it? Oh, it's heartbreaking to pass that threshold, uh, grim overall, but also you think uh, of all the loved ones left behind. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. When the history of Britain's self-isolation is written, my next guest will certainly get a mention. If you're a gym bunny watching this, do you have exercises for that person as well? Try this one. Squat jumps, really get off the ground, and then you've got lunge jumps. We can't appear on the stage and we can't um, be in a studio and things, but we can be on this extraordinary thing called um, Zoom. Mm -hmm to offend a tiny bit to work out what uh, what's funny. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah, no, actually, I'm reading P.G. Woodhouse and Agatha Christie at the moment. Wash your hands and stay indoors, thank you, baked potatoes. You're going to be coming and sitting on my lap. <laughs> I can hardly wait. We weren't going to tell people about that, Joanna. You must listen to what the baked potatoes say. I've been making lots of soup. Uh, in anticipation of not being able to get much food. This is the ultimate comfort food. I can't believe my mum will be so proud of me that I'm on the Andrew Marr show talking about chicken soup. You've no idea. You are Professor Lockdown. When is it going to end? I'm very well aware of the economic impact of this current policy, and we would all like these measures to be able to be relaxed as soon as possible. Following the science means understanding that we don't have the answers yet. 
Was there a point at which you thought the NHS was going to be overwhelmed? We were being advised by the epidemiologists and the public health experts that we could see as many as two million people requiring hospital care. Two million? Of whom perhaps a third might require intensive care. And so, yes. We had to work very, very fast to go through many of the stages in vaccine development that would normally take about five years, and we've done them in four months. Professor Gilworth, I know you've been working around the clock and working all the time. You've taken time out to talk to us, so thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Right, I'll get back to work. <laughs> Is this it? Is the dreaded second wave of coronavirus now approaching? The numbers are shooting up. Your government was paying us to go and eat out, which spread the virus, was telling us, ordering us to go back into the office, which spread the virus. If anyone was complacent and blasé, it was you. Well, look, and look, I take full responsibility for everything that's happened since the, the pandemic began, of course, and, and the government, uh, you know, is trying, as I say, throughout this to strike a balance. Can I turn to one other issue, which has been... Uh, a source of great confusion, which is the 10pm curfew. Why are you abstaining? Well, because it's very clear that we do need further restrictions. Boris Johnson said only in September, I don't want a second national lockdown. I think it would be completely wrong for this country. I don't want a lockdown. It's the last thing I want. And the Prime Minister, I know, um, uh, shares that feeling profoundly. From Thursday until the start of December, you must stay at home. A lot of people are asking this question inside your party. They say the Boris Johnson of autumn 2020 just isn't up to it. Well, that is why Boris Johnson, who has a turn of phrase, calls you Captain Hindsight. He says you're criticising things they used to do, but whatever they do now, you just agree with them. There is a gap between how you present yourself very, very effectively and what's really been going on in Scotland. You may have been conscious, but you did not protect people in Northern Ireland care homes properly at the start of this. Some of your colleagues have described it as being like wildfire in Welsh care homes. Now, in terms of public health, there are, for the first time in ages, reasons to be cheerful. Vaccines are coming. This isn't going to go on forever. Winter is going to end. A week ago today, you were sitting there waiting for the phone call to tell you whether this vaccine worked and, if so, how effectively. Just tell us a little bit about the moment when the phone rang. I knew that we will get an, a call at 8 yeah, uh, and uh, uh, providing us this answer. And how did you celebrate? We sit together uh, and, and had a tea together. Of course, everyone in Britain will be delighted that you had a cup of tea to celebrate. <laughs> How much do we hear and feel the pain of those struggling, the inconsolable families, the ill, the dying and the bereaved? And I'm joined here in the studio by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Archbishop, uh, looking at those pictures, there's going to be an awful lot of people, in whatever tier they're in around the UK, who are going to be facing Christmas with a missing uh, hole around the table, somebody who would be there in normal circumstances but has died with coronavirus. Uh, you've suffered a lot of loss yourself, I know that. As Archbishop, as a Christian leader, what would you say to them about the Christmas they're about to face? I would say that it is very hard and that pretending otherwise is not helpful. That we have to face our losses and unless in one way or another we make something of the memories, they attack us. Therefore, talk to each other on the phone where you can't talk in person, which is for most of us much of the time, share, think about the person, bring their memories back, look for the healing that is there. As a Christian leader, I know that we have 
a God who at Christmas we remember light came into the world and the readings we always have say the light, the darkness has not overcome the light. There is that light of memory, that light of hope. This is the great Christian festival, one of the great Christian festivals. The newspapers are saying Christmas is cancelled, is it? No. Uh, the celebrations are cancelled. We will come to those again. This is very different to what we hoped for and longed for, and it is the most intense pain for a lot of people. We protest, we lament, and in our prayers and in our services, we will be doing that. But it's not cancelled because Jesus, we, at, its, at the heart of Christmas is Jesus coming into the world, God coming into the world. And that takes us on looking forward to Easter and God who died, the crucified God who rose from the dead. This is a moment of God saying, I am with you in the mess and I have overcome the darkness. There is hope. Um, across the UK, outside the South East, of course, people can gather in small groups for Christmas Indeed. Day. Um, a lot of people will, will, however, be very lonely and worried on Christmas Day. And again, how would you advise them to, to overcome that? Well, there's practical advice. Um, there's a campaign called Together at Christmas, which I'm uh, chair of, which uh, its slogan is um, check in and check up. Mm. So you, you give people a call. First way, if you're on your own, spend time on the, telev on the telephone. If you're uh, I've had Christmases alone when I was young. Um, I remember one in particular. And I have no illusions about how dark it feels. Talk to people on the phone. Ring, share, um, and plan. Something about planning for the future helps us. Dream. What are you going to do? What are we going to do when this time is over. It may be many months yet, but as the vaccine comes in, life is going to change. What are we going to do to celebrate and to mourn and to grieve, but crying and laughing to celebrate? All of that is coming next year. If there was an 80-year-old um, devout Christian watching this programme and wondering how to balance health and protection with wanting to go to church on Christmas Day, what would you say to them? I would say that you know much better than I do what you should do. Don't feel under compulsion. Do what is sensible. Uh, my mother, who's in her 90s, will not go to church, I'm sure, because it's, it's, too it's, not, it's too dangerous. Um, there are clergy who have underlying health conditions who will not go to church. I will be in church, um, God willing, and, and for your 80-year-old, I'd say, uh, get out, get some fresh air if you can, if you're fit enough to walk, but talk to people, look at something on the television, uh, ring up uh, the Hope Line, you can find out the number for that, which is services and prayers and carols especially and, and talks for Christmas. Do what you can, not, you, not what you can't. But if you do go to church, keep away from the choir. <laughs> the choir always make me keep away from them because my voice is so bad but um, yes keep away from the choir and above all um, to quote the Dean of Canterbury don't mingle don't mingle after the service wave, wave happily and, wave to and people go. and go wave and go home I'm waving happily Archbishop thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning thank you very much Andrew now then, I'm joined from Salford by the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Lisa Nandy. Uh, Lisa Nandy, um, thanks for joining us. Um, this new strain of the virus has produced new restrictions. Uh, party politics aside, and I'm sure we'll come to party politics, in terms of the restrictions, do you support them? Yes, we've been asking the government all week to revise the Christmas restrictions in light of the new virulent strain of the virus and it is absolutely right that they've taken action. We just cannot believe that it's taken so long for them to do it and that we've had another week of dither and delay while people have made Christmas plans that now lie in chaos mm. and the virus has spread 
across the population. We just cannot continue like this. We've got to start taking this more seriously. It's just absolutely wrong that the Prime Minister was in the House of Commons mocking and ridiculing uh, concerns that were raised by Keir Starmer on Wednesday and yet a few days later is forced to accept what everybody could see was about to happen which is that Christmas plans were going to have to be restricted. There's just no way around it. We've got to keep people safe this Christmas. Now, they would say, and I'm trying to be fair to all sides, they would say we only got the new evidence about how fast this new strain spreads on Friday, and we took the decision and we announced it on the Saturday. You can't get faster than that. Well, we've been watching case rates rising at an alarming rate in London and the South East for several weeks. Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, knew about this strain last weekend. He came to the House of Commons on Monday. Every day this week, we've asked the government to introduce new restrictions and toughen up Christmas plans. Every single day they've rejected those suggestions. And this is what keeps happening over and over again. The Prime Minister rejects the evidence. He came to the House of Commons on Monday. Every day this week we've asked the government to introduce new restrictions and toughen up Christmas plans. Every single day they've rejected those suggestions. And this is what keeps happening over and over again. The Prime Minister rejects the evidence.
Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, wrote to the Prime Minister and said he would be willing to work with him to toughen up Christmas restrictions. Mm. On Wednesday, he urged him to act at the dispatch box and was mocked for doing so. And on Friday, Keir Starmer said that Wales showed how serious this had now got and it was absolutely clear that the Christmas restrictions must be toughened up at every stage this week. Those concerns have been dismissed by the government, only to find on Saturday that they had to change their mind. It's just simply not good enough. All right. Lisa Nandy, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, is with me now. Matt Hancock, you said um, recently that the virus was under control. Yes. Is it? No, uh, it's not. The new variant is out of control and we need to bring it under control. And this news about the new variant has been a... Uh, an incredibly difficult end to, frankly, an awful year. And it's important for everybody to act, uh, essentially act like they might have the virus. And that's the way that we can control it together. It's not something for government or individuals. It's something for us all to do uh, together. And we've got this challenge uh, around the world, actually, of increased numbers. The good, obviously, the good, hopeful news is that the vaccine is on its way, but we've got to stick together now and we've got to, we've got to all play our part in getting this back under control. So we're not in control of the virus. Let me ask you to look at some pictures. I suspect you've seen them quite recently anyway. This is the scenes from, uh, Lon- yeah. uh, fr- fr- from London train stations last night. Yeah. And people heard the restrictions and poured out of London in all directions. Well, can, uh, I put, can, I, can I put it to you that you're not in control of the virus and you're not in control of the message either? No, on the contrary, the message is incredibly clear in Tier 4 areas, which is to stay at home unless you absolutely need uh, to leave for one of the reasons that's, that's set out. Now, I think that the, the, uh, the scenes we saw last night... That looks like the new strain being spread around the country. That, I think the scene, those scenes were totally irresponsible. And as of first thing this morning, uh, the new law came in. I actually was up before five o'clock this morning ensuring that that new law has been in place. Um, And we've all got a responsibility. We in government, of course, have a responsibility. But so too does every single person. Because this is everybody knows. Let me uh, Andrew, everybody knows that this is an incredibly difficult situation. And it's one in which I understand the feelings that people have got and the, and the sense of loss over having to bring these sorts of restrictions in. And the what plea happened, that I have... Jump in. Is the, that, the plea what, that I have is on. that... The plea that I have is that people will play their part because it's only by acting all of us that we can keep this and get this under control. Well, in terms of your part, you told people yesterday that there was about to be a complete lockdown around London. And then you gave them five, six, seven hours to get out, having told them to make plans to go and see their families ahead of time. And many people did that. And as a result, you have spread this new strain right across other parts of England. Uh, No, thankfully, the numbers in the scenes that you've just shown are are small. Um, But what matters is that everybody has a responsibility. And, you know, the best gift that you could give somebody this Christmas is to stay at home and not transmit the virus. Because about a third of people who have the virus have no symptoms at all. So I I think all of us need to need to heed this message, and I know that throughout this okay, year we've been this, talking about sorry, this. Even this morning, people are loading up their cars and heading out of London. Are the police going to stop them? Are you going to actually sort of blockade roads and stop people leaving London? Are you going to put police on the train to stop them taking the trains? Are you actually going to enforce what you've said you're going to enforce? Well, of course, I've spoken to the Home Secretary, and the British Transport Police's responsibility is to police the transport system. Um, and, but I hope that this will be done by consent, as it has been so often. And, you know, it's easy so to play... W- w- will you actually be enforcing I'm, I'm still confused. Uh, yes, you've of course. spoken to the police, but will they be stopping people getting onto trains? Will they be stopping people climbing into their cars and driving off to the Midlands? Of course, it's the police's responsibility to police the law, and the law came into force in the early hours of this morning. But the, there is a bigger story than that, though, Andrew, which is that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We've all got to... I'll come on to the light later, but I just want to stick with where we are right now. Well, I just Can I ask you a couple more specific questions? 
this is a more infectious strain. Does that mean that the social distancing rules have to be looked at again and toughened up? Well, this is why we need a tougher uh, lockdown than we had in tier three or indeed that we had in the November lockdown. Because while the November lockdown... In terms lockdown, of human behaviour, in terms of people uh, mingling in the street, should they be keeping further apart? Should they be wearing masks even while walking outside in a shopping street? Those kind of questions. Well, the advice that we've got is that the, those, the two metre rules should continue. But what I'd say to every single person is that if you act like you have the virus, then that will stop the virus from spreading to others. And everybody's got a responsibility. It's not just the rules. It's also about how people behave within those rules. And this is so important because we can get there. We can see that light. But in the meantime, we have a few months that are going to be very difficult and that we all have to resist that temptation to do things right. that all of us find sure. completely natural in order to protect other people. A few more specifics. All around the world, people are preparing to fly back to Britain for Christmas or for the holidays. Now, most of the airports they're going to be flying into are Tier 4 airports now. They're in Tier 4 areas. So are they going to be stopped from arriving in Britain? Are you going to tell uh, British Airways and other carriers, don't take people back into Britain for the next several weeks? Well, we're not because the, there is a specific exemption, of course, for people arriving home. People need to be able to come home. But once you've arrived home in a Tier 4 area, you should then stay at home unless you've got a very specific right. uh, exemption. Are you still worried that hospitals are about to be overwhelmed? I'm really worried about the NHS. There are currently just over 18,000 people in uh, NHS hospitals with coronavirus. So that is only just below the number that there were at the first peak. So, of course, I'm worried about the NHS and working on it every day. The NHS is doing a brilliant job. It's also, of course, treating all the other diseases and doing much more of that than in the first peak. For instance, continuing all of the, the cancer sure. treatment as much as is practically possible. So we're a better place than we were in the first peak because we've spent all summer working on it and we have the testing capacity now to keep people safe in hospital. But of course I'm worried about the NHS. It's another reason that everybody needs to follow the new rules and just take that personal responsibility. Given where we are now, is it not inevitable that we're heading for a national lockdown again? Well, not necessarily. And one of the reasons that we brought no. in, not necessarily, one of the reasons we brought in the strict travel movements on Tier 4, saying stay local and stay at home, and in fact, stay local wherever you are across the UK, one of the reasons we brought that in is to try to stop this new variant from spreading. Because we know that Tier 3 works for the old variant, and we've seen numbers really fall, the case numbers really fall in, in most of the north of England, uh, in, uh, in many parts of the Midlands. Um, but we know that it doesn't work with the new variant because the new variant spreads mm -hmm. more easily. So that's why there's movement restrictions, to try sure. to stop this new variant from spreading. When did you first know about the new variant? I found out last Friday afternoon. Only and last Friday afternoon? Yeah. We've, just, we've just heard that um, WHO, for instance, knew there was a new variant about in September. They didn't know how infectious it was, but it was known about in September. I, I don't think that's quite right. The, well, we just heard from the WHO. Uh, I, listen, I listened to the interview, and I'll explain the, what happened and who knew what when, as far as we know it. It's that in October, they spotted the new variant from a sample that had been taken in September. And then in uh, just over uh, a week ago... The, this pattern was spotted in Kent where it was growing fast. So I was told about the new variant last Friday, and as you know, we brought in further restrictions last uh, weekend, brought them into force on Monday and uh, Tuesday as a result. Um, then we only knew that there was a new variant, and it was in the parts of the country that where things were growing fast, that there was a correlation. On Friday afternoon, they came, the scientists came and said, we now know there's a causality and that it spreads up to 70% faster. And it's the causality right. that, is, that is the great so, worry. So here is the problem with what you've said. The problem with what you said is what the Prime Minister told the country at his press conference yesterday. He said, and I quote, we were very puzzled during the November the 5th to December the 3rd autumn measures by why Tier 3 system wasn't delivering results in Kent and a couple of other places 
clearly there was something going on. Did yes. you not think there was something going on? Yes, and that's why... So you knew there was a problem? Yes, and let me... It precisely. And here so, I'm sorry to jump this. No, no I'm going to answer you, the... Going, you, I'll answer the question, Andrew, since right. you asked it. And I'll, really, really precisely. Uh, because of the uh, continued rise in cases in Kent... We therefore looked in detail at what was going on in Kent. Mm. And uh, Susan, who you had, Susan Hopkins, who you had on the programme earlier, uh, was working to, to look at the new strains in Kent to see whether there were clusters. It was because of that work that this was spotted, and only because of the massive genomic surveillance effort that we have in this country, built on our very strong genomic science, that we were able to spot this. So that was then brought to Minister's attention last Friday. So, so, so the, the... Way before last Friday, you were puzzled. You knew something was going on, yeah, but you right. decided to end the lockdown anyway. Now, the question then is why you ignored so many other sources of medical and scientific alarm about what you were doing ending the lockdown. Uh, Chris Hopkins, Hopkins last Sunday, uh, of NHS providers, said, if the infection rates remain as high as they are at the moment, relaxing the restrictions will trigger a third wave. And then on Tuesday, the British Medical Journal said, we believe the government is about to blunder into another major error that will cost many lives. So people were warning you about the rates, and yet you weren't doing much about it. And then on Wednesday, this happened. Let's look at the Prime Minister in the House of Commons. Mr Speaker, I wish he'd had the, the, the guts just to say what he really wants to do, which is to, to cancel the plans people have, have made and, and cancel, uh, cancel Christmas. That's really, that's what he, I think that's what he's driving at, Mr Speaker. Uh, he's, look, uh, he's looking a bit blank. Don't you feel a bit embarrassed about that? That looks like playing politics at a time when the Prime Minister knew that the pandemic was spreading faster. Well, last weekend, after we found out about the new variant, but before we knew that it transmitted uh, faster, we brought in further measures, precisely following, as you were saying, the, uh, the NHS uh, um, requirement. Um, and, of course, we don't want to cancel Christmas, and I think the Archbishop of Canterbury just spoke very movingly about how Christmas is not cancelled, it will be different this year. We don't want to take any of these measures, but it's our duty to take them when the evidence is clear and the evidence became clear on Friday and in fact the evidence was brought to us as ministers at three o'clock on Friday the Prime Minister made the statement at four o'clock on Saturday as it happens this is one of the fastest decisions I've seen in government to go from the evidence of this 70% up to 70% increased transmission mm. to putting in this action very difficult decision taken extraordinarily quickly. And all of these challenges are essentially based on the fact this is okay. an unprecedented situation. But why, as a government, have you been gloating and mocking the opposition for asking for stricter measures at a time when you were about to do it yourself? Well, I don't think anybody's been gloating. Well, that's, that's what that clip looked like to a lot of people. Well, I don't think that's true. I think what we've been doing is addressing an unprecedented situation with both the... The, the firmness that's needed, but also understanding the, the other consequences of the actions that we take. You know, when we take an action like this and when we put in place restrictions like this, the, 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 we yeah. know the huge impact that has on people's lives. And, and you Can know, I, I had to call my mum last mm -hmm. night and say, I'm really sorry, but we're not going to sure. see you at Christmas, just like so many other people did. And so I, I get that side can, of things I, as can well. I, can I put it to you, Matt Hancock? What is really annoying people this morning is not what happened yesterday particularly, which people do understand, but it was what the government was saying before. After that exchange uh, with Keir Starmer, uh, the Prime Minister was still calling upon people, you were still calling upon people, to self-isolate for five days before having their jolly Christmas at home. Lots and lots of people you know, closed the white van, parked it up, or left their offices and went home and self-isolated to, so that they could go forward with the Christmas plans which your government had told them specifically they could have. They, they were promised a certain kind of Christmas, and they listened to you, and they did it. And that was a huge, huge mistake, was it not? You have, you have taken away the hopes of an awful lot of people for their Christmas, and you didn't need to do it this way. I think that the mistake would be to ignore new scientific evidence. And all the way through this crisis, we've been trying to learn as much as we possibly can, and then balance the incredibly difficult decisions between the impact of the action that we have to take to save lives and the impact of not acting. 
And you know there are no easy answers. There, there are. are no there are no easy options. In fact, that's not just true of us in government. That's true of all of us. Okay. And we've got to get through this together. And I'm sure that we can. How much have you really learned, though? Because the whole way through this, we've been a, 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 a pattern of overpromising, of boosterism, of optimism. You know, we're going to get rid of it all in 12 weeks. It is going to be perfectly over by Christmas, over by Christmas. It's going to be a normal Christmas. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. It's as if this government is too scared, too cowardly to give people the really hard news when they need to hear it. And then last, at the last minute, you do a kind of U-turn, a screech of brakes, and it's too late, and it feels chaotic, as it did yesterday. Well, I simply think that's completely wrong. I'm sitting here and telling you, and telling, and the Prime Minister yesterday told the nation that we have to bring in an effective lockdown in large swathes of England because of a new variant strain that's being seen here and in some other countries around the world in order to save lives. And we're saying that we don't know how long this, these measures are going to be in place. It may be for some time until we can get the vaccine going. That isn't an easy thing to say. These things are not straightforward. And I, I, I totally understand how people are frustrated at the situation and disappointed. Of course I do. But, but they're also... But they're also if, 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 then suddenly at the last minute, if you... If, I'll just finish the answer. Thank you. Um, it, people are feeling cross, frustrated, and in many cases angry. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we all have to come together to get through this is because collectively we all face the same enemy. Mm -hmm. And now it's with this new strain, it's a, it's a more difficult task than it was. And the best way through that is for people to look out for each other and support each other and all come together to take the action that's necessary. Not taking the easy and sometimes, you know, and pushing at the boundaries, but everybody living within the restrictions that unfortunately we have to have in place so that we can get through this with as few fatalities as possible whilst the vaccine can come and, 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 yeah. and change this for good. So you feel that I'm being unfair when I characterise the government's behaviour. Let me ask you about what's happened with schools, which is a specific example, which is on Monday, the Education Secretary threatened London boroughs uh, whose schools were wanting to move to online teaching only with the law. He said he was going to take the law against them and that they must change their... Uh, position and he said it's simply not in children's best interests to close their doors and then on Thursday his minister told all schools to move to online teaching and close their doors again it seemed extraordinary behavior well no that's that's not a reflection of what happened and I'm Isn't what, well I'm afraid I've got the I'm, here. I'm afraid Andrew you're mischaracterizing it in, in what way in in the way that our goal is to bring schools back in uh, January with a big testing regime and that means we need a staggered start in order to test people uh, with, a, uh, with the coronavirus test. But of course, there are a, some years... I'm sorry to jump in, but this is a testing regime which teachers yes. say they just cannot deliver. I totally Nicola Mason, yeah. who's head of school uh, okay. at Chase Terrace Academy in Burntwood in Staffordshire, says she very much wants to do the testing system. But she says, and I quote, this government have at the very last minute again literally broken the teachers. The guidance is way too late to plan effectively. If we need to recruit volunteers by the 4th of January, that is impossible. Again, well, last I, I'm minute. Afraid, Andrew, I'm afraid, Andrew, it's not impossible. And I can tell you why, because it's already happening in some schools where we've been piloting this. Um, and there are, there are three weeks between now and the start of term, and I appreciate that, like so many people in the NHS, there is going to have to be some work over the Christmas break. That's absolutely fine. And I'll tell you what, there are head teachers around the country who are desperate to do their part to get as much education as is possible and to do it safely. And so, of course, in a massive system like the school system, you can always find uh, the, is somebody who's going to There's quite um, a lot. Complain. It's not just one. There are the vast majority, I tell you, want to educate children and to make sure they're safe and use the testing regime that we now have in place to make that happen. And I know the Education Secretary is working incredibly hard on this. And, you know, I, of okay. course, Straight throughout... Question. If, throughout Straight question. Throughout, Are schools going to open in January as normal? Throughout, there have been noises off about, from people in all sorts of parts of the response. We've had all sorts. And our task is to try to to try to weave a line through the incredibly difficult decisions where there's no easy options 
on either side. I certainly think there are no easy options here, but I ask you again, are schools going to open as normal in January or not? Well, legally? as I was saying, the plan is not for a normal opening. It's staggered opening. It's for a staggered start in order to ensure that there's testing so that we can isolate the children who are positive and therefore keep people safe. Is it possible they will close again as they did in the first lockdown? Well, you know, I've learned to not to rule anything out in this uh, uh, in this pandemic. Okay. But the plan is for schools to open with the staggered start that we've described. How many people have been vaccinated so far? Well, as of eight o'clock yesterday morning, it was three hundred and fifty thousand, and so I'm hoping, uh, but it's not a target. I'm hoping that by the end of this weekend, across the UK as a whole, we should be at around half a million. Because you said millions by the end of the year. You're not going to hit that target, are you? Yes, I was, I was, I, I was talking about there would be millions of doses delivered by the end of the year. I misspoke in that quote and I said vaccinated. I meant vaccines delivered, delivered to the country. And we've, uh, we've been clear about that. OK. Do you think the AstraZeneca vaccine is going to be authorised before the year is over? Well, I really hope so, Andrew, uh, but it's for the independent regulator right. and I don't want to put any pressure on them one way or the other. But just, okay. like, just like the Pfizer vaccine, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine would be a huge boost for the nation. All right. Um, one final question. Is this really the responsible time to leave the European Union without a trade deal, given everything that's going on and everything facing the country? Is it responsible? Is it right? Well, I really hope not. Uh, but at the same time, the EU have recently, in the last couple of weeks, put in place some, uh, what I think are unreasonable demands uh, into a negotiation that previously had been going uh, well and coming towards a conclusion. I, uh, it's especially, as you say, with all the problems that are going on on the continent as well as here, in the EU, where they have very serious problems as well, I hope that the EU moves on its unreasonable demands that I don't think anybody could reasonably accept and then we can get a deal and uh, a trade deal because we've already got the deal for okay. leaving. But we're ready, whatever, whatever's necessary. People are beginning to ask whether you are up to this job. Uh, Charles Wheeler, the, uh, the deputy vice chairman of the 1922 committee, has suggested that you might resign. Well, I know that Charles is very upset at the measures that we've had to bring in, and he has been throughout. And I, I understand that, and I understand where he's coming from. But unfortunately, these measures are absolutely necessary to save lives. And, you know, if you hear from the and you're NHS, going nowhere. well, of course, I'm, I'm dealing with a global pandemic right. in the best way that we possibly can, right. uh, with huge pressures already on the NHS, uh, with a, a case rates that are climbing. And we must take action no matter how uncomfortable we find it. All right. Matt Hancock, thanks very much for coming to talk to us. And thank you for watching during this extraordinary year. And thank you to all my guests. But before we go, it might not be the Christmas we were all hoping for or wanted, but it is Christmas and we want to finish with some cheer. Annie Lennox's Christmas album is 10 years old this year and we're going to end this morning with a carol from it, The Holly and the Ivy. This version was especially recorded for us by Annie in lockdown in a home in Los Angeles. I'll be back on January the 3rd, but until then... Goodbye and have the best Christmas that you can. I'd like to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.